Uh, a large part of what you're going to see here was work done at UT Dallas. Just want to give that little disclaimer, but we're very excited to be here at Michigan um, with Electrical Engineering and the Robotics Institute. And so we'll be doing a lot of cool stuff here over the coming years. So the uh, motivation behind my talk is uh, challenges to human mobility. And in particular, we're very interested in challenges faced by lower limb amputees. So there's about a million Americans with uh, lower limb loss, as well as general mobility limitations that can be caused by stroke, advanced age, osteoarthritis, uh, lower back pain, muscul musculoskeletal disorders, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in fact, it's pretty staggering numbers. About one in eight adults in the United States has some sort of mobility disability. And so the, uh, the features of, of gait experienced by these individuals include uh, more frequent falling, more metabolic energy consumption, walking from point A to point B, and uh, slower walking, and so forth. And so there's certainly a lot of room for improvement of conventional prosthetic and orthotic devices to enable uh, greater uh, mobility in these populations. And so our approach, uh, my, my group, likes to think of legged robots as a, a cycle of, of life for, for, uh, for achieving these goals. And so we like to borrow and develop concepts in the area of legged robots, uh, autonomous robots like Cassie, and then translate those into powered prosthetic legs, learning how to, to cooperate and synchronize to the human um, with the robotic device, as well as in exoskeletons, trying to augment an existing limb that may have some sort of weakness or deficit to it. And then through the process of learning how to apply these control methods to humans, we actually learn a little bit more about how to make more human-like autonomous walking as well. So we can make these robots walk in a more natural, lifelike manner. So that's, that's the cycle that we embrace. And so the organization of this talk is as follows. I'm going to start by discussing our efforts in user-synchronized kinematic control of agile powered prostheses. And so when I say kinematic control, I mean controlling joint position and velocity. Then we'll talk about energy-aware actuator design in order to enable greater mobility in these, de um, in, in these devices. And then we'll, we'll close with uh, discussions on energetic design and control for partially assistive exoskeletons that, that only provide some support for an individual, not complete support. And so you'll see how we're kind of going from this kinematic control paradigm towards this energetic control paradigm in, the, in this talk. So this is the state of the art in the field of powered prosthetic legs. At least it was when I entered the field. And so the idea is you look at the gait cycle, and you notice it has uh, several uh, different phases of gait, which are indicative of certain behaviors, such as heel contact, push off of the, during late stance, and then the swing phases. And so essentially, the way that control engineers were we're designing the powered devices for, for amputees in the past is to design a different controller for each of these behaviors. So each of these controller, each of these boxes may have a proportional derivative controller in it. Sometimes they, um, in the field we call it an impedance controller. And then there'll be some switching rules to go from one mode to the next. Now the problem is that all these things are, are subject dependent. So I walk differently than Rom, Rom walks differently than Gray, and so on. And so we actually end up having an explosion in parameters that require patient-specific tuning that is not intuitive, because these things may not necessarily have physical intuition behind them, especially the, 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 the switching rules and some of the parameters, depending on which control methods you're using. And it takes a lot of time. And the problem gets even worse when you think about variable activity locomotion. So typically, you'd have a higher level state machine where you'd have, let's say, five different modalities you can use. And each one of those things would have its own lower level cycle here with its own parameters. And so 
what ended up happening is you'd spend, and I've done this uh, during my postdoctoral training, you'd spend hours, sometimes days, with one person trying to optimize these parameters to make them walk just right. Uh, and so it's not a clinically viable solution, right? No, Medicare, uh, insurance, whatever, is not going to pay for five hours of, of tuning with a team of engineers. And it's also not necessarily very accessible to people who haven't had training in control theory, uh, such as clinicians. And so that's, that's the challenge. And so uh, I took inspiration from the field of robot walking to address this challenge. Now, um, this is a robot uh, that was um, designed by, by Eric Westervelt, who I believe is a Michigan alum, right? Um, and then later adopted by Jim Schmiedler at Notre Dame. And so Ernie, as, as he, he's called, um, you'll see in this video, is controlling its hip and its knee angles as a function of its hip progression, okay? So it's measuring the progression of the, of the center of mass of the hip and so as the robot's pushed forward, its leg joints will track a pattern in the forward direction. And when it's pushed backwards, it tracks back in, the, in a backward direction. And then when you give it a nice push, it can actually fall into a nice self-fulfilling walking cycle where uh, actuation energy, energy injection from the, the leg joints cause more forward propulsion, which then keeps the joints moving forward and so on. Now, this idea actually um, originated from Jesse Grizzle here at Michigan. Uh, and this is the, the notion of a phase variable. Okay? So it's a, it's a time invariant parameterization of the joint trajectories. So let's say that you want to track this kinematic pattern. So this is joint angle over time. But you want to track it in a time invariant manner so that you can, so that the robot it can always keep up with its, with its progression, right? So that the leg is never too far behind or too far ahead. And so what you do is you try to find, at least during steady walking, a monotonically increasing signal that you can measure, which we call a phase variable. So this could be the hip position going forward in space um, over time. And so then if you measure that phase variable, you can then parameterize your kinematics as a function of that. And the, the beauty of this is that if you're walking and then suddenly someone grabs you and stops you from moving, then your joint angles, which are being controlled as a function of this phase variable, will stop, right, synchronizing with your progression. And then as soon as you let go of the, of the, of the robot, then it'll keep moving again, right? And so you end up seeing this, uh, so you see this little phase shift here that's happening over time. But because we've represented the trajectories as a function of a phase variable, it's almost as, it's as if nothing happened, right? Because you never left the desired profile. You just simply slowed it down and then restarted it, OK? So that's the idea of a phase variable. And it's turned out to work really well for walking robots. These things can walk and run and, and climb stairs and so forth. You can push them, and they'll recover. Uh, and, and that's still going on here at Michigan with uh, Jesse and, and Rom's groups. So uh, we wanted to use this for controlling a prosthetic leg. But that then motivated the question of how can we measure a phase variable that represents the progression of human walking? And so my former PhD student, uh, Dr. Villarreal, uh, came up with this, this concept of the thigh phase angle, which is a uh, a strong predictor of the distal joint patterns. And so the idea here is that uh, if you're measuring the, the angle of the thigh with respect to gravity, so this is a global and inertial measurement, then you look at it over time, it has a sinusoidal trajectory. Okay? And so when you have a sinusoidal trajectory like this, you can build a phase orbit. This, this orbit in the phase portrait actually gives you a clock, a sense of, a sense of timing, which is actually time invariant, because it's based on the, the position of the thigh moving over time. Okay. And so in this study, uh, Dr. Villarreal even showed that it's, uh, the distal joint patterns are still um, 
highly correlated with the progression of the thigh, even across perturbations. So if you trip someone, at least with a, with, with a reasonably um, magnitude perturbation, they, you can still predict distal joint patterns with this, this measurement. Now, if you, if you really trip someone and they are near, you know, to the point of really, nearly falling over, well, then there might be some reflexes that kick in that might not be well explained by this. But at least subtle perturbations are well captured by this idea of a phase variable. And so we implemented this concept in our first leg design. This is our Gen 1 robotic leg. It wasn't designed for looks, OK? So it's not the prettiest leg. But um, it was designed, uh, it was our first, first attempt at building a, a wearable robot. Um, uh, so the, the key features here is that uh, it has an inertial measurement unit at the top of the knee joint, which gives you the orientation of the thigh. OK, so it has an accelerometer gyro in there. And it has a knee actuator and an ankle actuator. And I'm pointing out that, that it's highly geared. I'm not trying to brag about that. I'm just pointing out that it's highly geared because that's going to become a problem later. And I'm going to talk about how we're going to solve that as well. OK, definitely I'm not bragging about that. <laughs> OK, and this is work by Dr. Quintero, who's now at SFSU. And so having this, um, this implementation in, in the prosthetic leg, we also need to figure out how are we going to define the kinematic patterns that the leg will follow. And so what we do is we, we start with able-bodied normative kinematics, which we then reparameterize again as a function of this phase variable. But then we allow the clinician to visually augment that, that trajectory. So you can imagine that uh, the, uh, the patient puts on the robotic leg, starts walking with it, but because every gait should be user-specific, should be unique, um, the clinician may observe, OK, they need a little bit more push off during late stance, or maybe a little bit more flexion during swing. And so then they can grab these, these control points and, and move, manipulate the traje trajectory. And then it re-encodes the, the, uh, the function of the phase variable. So essentially, we have, we have these functions of phi, which is the phase variable. And that then leads you to an error vector where um, theta is the actual, truly the measured angles of the, of the leg. This is the desired angle of the leg, given the phase. And so you have an error vector. And then the simplest way to control the leg is to control torque based on a proportional derivative control law. Right? That's the first thing we, we all learn. And so we do that. It works. Um, but there's also uh, more rigorous uh, formal methods, such as hybrid zero dynamics. And uh, Dr. Martin uh, has a really nice paper on that theoretical approach. Uh, but we're not going to use the, the theoretical approach in the experiments just because it's difficult to model these things and, and it results in other challenges. So in the experiments to follow, we're, we're using proportional derivative control. All right, so this was our very first amputee subject. The very first time anyone had put on our, our, our uh, any patient had put on our leg. And um, this was just him acclimating to it. And we were, just, we were just recording the video um, while we were shooting the breeze with this subject. And I highly recommend doing that. You know, record everything, just in case something interesting happens, right? Even, even if, it's like a, if it's an outtake, it could be useful. And so here, we're just chatting with him. And we noticed that he became kind of comfortable with the leg and started kind of moving his weight, shifting it forward and backwards. And then we, we asked him, so what, what are you doing here? And he's like, well, I, I've, I've I understand that, that the foot's going to be where I expect it to be based on my hip motion. So I can actually trust that it's going to be behind me when I need it to be. So he's not looking at it. He can't feel it, right, because he has no proprioception. But he has learned this mapping from his hip motion to the prosthetic foot position. And so essentially, he was able to then you know, volitionally to a degree. It's not true volitional control, but he's at least able to, to control the foot position where he wants it to be. And so that, that, was, that was pretty nifty. And this was work in collaboration with uh, Susan Cap. And so here's a, a sequence of experiments demonstrating how uh, walking with a conventional prosthesis, which is what we're going to see first. This is the leg that this subject uses every day. 
and then comparing that with walking with our powered leg. He's actually a pretty good walker with it. So it's a little loud, and we'll talk about that later. That has to do with the uh, high gearing and the use of a ball screw. Now, walking backwards is hard because with this conventional leg, he has no control over foot position. But again, with the power leg and this controller, he can trust that the foot will be where it should be when based on his hip motion. Backwards. Yeah, that, that was because we have, I'll talk about it in a second. Yeah. Yeah, but you, you can go forward and backwards. And we can also do things like crossing obstacles, which the controller was not explicitly designed for that. But we're able to based again on this mapping from hip motion to foot position. Okay, so, so Ram, the question about the snapping. So we, we, I'm kind of trivializing things a bit here. Um, mm -hmm. We have some safety th mechanisms in place so that the leg doesn't, for example, um, switch from stance to swing uh, erratically or when you don't want it to do it. And so uh, in order for the, um, the leg to start flexing um, before you actually take a step forward, uh, we, we require it to have a certain amount of uh, motion to, to actually engage what we would call a backwards state, but it's all based on the phase variable though. It's just that there's some supervisory logic that prevents it from, from switching too quickly. Yeah. yeah. Um, this one was a little more entertaining, so we got a pretty good soccer kick out of this. Oh, nice. <laughs> so. <laughs> Better than I can do at least, right? All right. So, um, and so here's steady walking. Th this participant does keep his hands on the uh, handrails. But yeah, yeah, this might have to do with the actual design of the device. Yeah, so just trust me on that one. Um, so you get more normative uh, energy injection into the gait cycle. And so in particular, like for example, while we're walking at multiple speeds. We, normative it would be the knee work gets more negative as, as you go faster because your knee's doing more braking as you, go, as you walk faster. And ankle work would go up because your ankle's doing more propulsion as you go faster. And so we, we get that. Whereas with a, with a passive uh, conventional leg, um, this would be more or less level and it wouldn't ne be nearly as high either because it's a net zero mechanical work paradigm, right? I mean, these prostheses conventionally do have springiness in them, so they can store and release energy, but they can inject energy, yeah. And so this results in more normative biomechanics, and the, that's still kind of somewhat, you know, uh, a theoretical concept, but this is where things really matter. So we look at compensations of the amputee participant, and uh, there are three that are very common in amputees. So there's hip circumduction, where they kind of rotate their hips so that they, so their foot doesn't drag the ground. There's hip hiking, which is exactly what it sounds like, again, to prevent the foot from dragging on the ground. And then on the sound side, they have ankle vaulting, where they, they kind of push off too early to, again, provide ground clearance. And what we see compared to the passive, so the dotted line is the passive and the, pow the powered is the blue, we see actually a reduction in these compensations. They're not completely eliminated, and we, we wouldn't expect that after one experiment, but we do see an almost immediate reduction in them. So this is relevant because um, these compensations are metabolically co costly. Also, they tend to, to wear the, the joints, the, the, the intact joints fast. So uh, amputees tend to have arthritic hips and arthritic knees in the sound side and so, so forth because they're overusing their sound, sound limbs. Okay, so, at this point, I've described 
a continuous sense of phase, but we still have a discrete sense of task in the sense that we would have to know what the task is, the activity, in order to change the kinematic pattern of the leg. Because right? so far, we've just made a, the kinematic pattern time invariant, but there's still a, a profile that are, there that we're tracking. And so in order to do different things like walking on inclines or stairs, you'd have to change those kinematic profiles somehow. And so you could do that with a classifier. But m my goal, uh, and our, the topic of our current R01 project, is to have a continuous sense of, ta of activity, of task, uh, in order to allow uh, navigation over continuously varying speeds, inclines, and other types of, of uh, like transitions to stairs and so forth. And so the goal here is that we can define a multi-dimensional activity space where, um, for example, slope, the incline, can be any real number within some range. Speed can be um, any positive real number within some range. And then, for example, stairs, like are, are you on a staircase, one? Are you not, zero? Or are you transitioning between them? And that'd be some number in between zero and one. And then our goal is to have a kinematic model that given a point in this activity space will then give us a prediction of what the kinematics should look like. Okay? And so you see here that for these three different points in the activity space, we have three different trajectories that we'd want to track in the prosthesis. So that, that's the goal. And so we have some preliminary uh, work in this, in this direction where we're trying to use samples of, these, of this activity space. And so in this, in this study, our activity space is just uh, variable inclines and speeds. And so we, use, we do a motion capture study where, you can, where we sample a certain number of these speeds and a certain number of these inclines and combinations of the two. But we can't possibly sample the, continu the continuous range, right? That's not possible. And so we need a model that can predict in between those samples. And so in order to avoid overfitting, uh, we, we wish to use regularization to find a model that explains the underlying features in the data in a way that can allow us to predict activities that we don't actually have samples of from the motion capture study. Okay, and so, for example, this function b here would be a function of the phase variable, okay? And that would be, for example, that would come from a set of trigonometric polynomials, and c would be a function of a vector of describing the, the inclination um, and speed, I guess. I, I projected away speed, but speed would also be in there. And so essentially we use group L1 regularization, which is a machine learning method for for trying to induce sparsity in the model, okay? And so we're able to show that this is actually a stronger predictor of, of unknown, of, of, of untrained activities compared to, for example, linear interpolation, which is exactly what we would all try first, right? So essentially, we, our, our error, our prediction error is statistically significantly better using our sparse model than just using uh, linear interpolation. And so the, the argument here is that then we can uh, reliably predict the desired kinematics for any incline or speed that we can, that we can detect from the, from the environment. Okay. Now det detecting the incline and speed is a challenge in its own right, which we're working on. Um, but that, this is the idea. And so uh, we're currently working on modeling and control of, again, these continuously varying activities. But we also want to consider stairs and maybe one day running. The, the, the ultimate goal, of course, having a control system that can perform all the activities of daily living in a seamless manner. And so we have a way of doing that, um, theoretically at least, in terms of transitions between a certain set of activity modes, like stairs, flat ground, sitting, and then each of those modes might be parameterized by an incline and a speed that would then allow us to have this continuously varying um, set of activities. So this is an early project that's still ongoing. Uh, however, 
in order to actually achieve this, um, we're going to have to address the limitations in the hardware that some of you have already pointed out. Um, the hardware is loud. The hardware is heavy. Um, it's got umbilical cords attached to it. And it's very stiff. It, when we use these highly geared transmissions, it makes the, the joints very stiff in the sense that they're not back drivable. They, you can't, they don't naturally swing with dynamics. And so the, actual, the motor has to literally do everything for, for, the, for the robot to move. And that's not how human joints work, right? And so um, this is where we're now looking at using better hardware, um, such as uh, prosthetic legs that, that actually think about how they use energy. In particular, um, the open source leg was designed by Elliot Rouse here at Michigan, and we're one of the lucky uh, early recipients of it. And it has a series elastic actuator. So essentially, it, you put a spring in series um, between the gearbox and the load, which provides compliance to impacts. It also allows you to uh, store energy and then release it. And so it has the potential to reduce energy consumption in that manner. It also provides some back drivability and lots of different potential benefits. But if we're going to be using this for controlling vari variable activities, that begs the question of how should we select stiffness for, for, the, uh, for the series elastic actuator? And so in Elliot's design, he has six different selectable stiffness options you can choose, but you can't, you can't pull them out mid-gate mid cycle, right? You can't, you can't change the stiffness as the leg is being used. And so, at least not yet. And so the question is, how do we select an optimal stiffness that will allow energy efficient uh, ener uh, electrical energy consumption, as well as uh, satisfying actuator constraints? For example, you don't want to, uh, to bottom out the spring, because then it becomes a rigid actuator as soon as the, the spring bottoms out. And, and also limitations like um, uh, the peak torque and velocity of the motor and so forth. And so that motivated a, a different NSF project, which is in its early stages, where we're trying to uh, have a method for a robust design of series elastic actuators. And it, so it turns out, um, Edgar, Edgar, Dr. Boulevard is here in the audience somewhere. There we go. So was a PhD student with me and now a postdoc with me. Um, so Edgar realized that you can express the energy consumed by the motor as a quadratic function of the spring compliance. So that's, that's the inverse of stiffness, right? And so what is energy consumption? Well, it's, it's not the energy to move the load, because that, that's, that can't be reduced. That, that's just uh, first principles. But it includes um, energy losses due to a viscous friction. OK, so friction results in loss. And joule heating. So that's the heating that comes from Joule's law, uh, the windings of the motor. You, know, you, you put through current through it, and, and, you, and it heats up with uh, scales with uh, current squared. And so um, we can potentially reduce those things through the design of the, of the spring. And so in Edgar's uh, analysis, he was able to show that you can actually express this as a quadratic function, energy consumption. And, and, and in the case of a linear spring, meaning a, a, a constant stiffness, that means that you have a convex function of, of energy over, over, over compliance. So you can very easily find the optimum that minimizes energy consumption, right? Now, uh, if you're thinking about a nonlinear spring, well, then x would be a trajectory of compliance that has certain constraints on it, for example, you want your, um, your spring to uh, have a monotonic relationship uh, between uh, displacement and torque, right? So in order for it to be conservative. So we have, we have uh, inequalities that, are, that correspond to actuator constraints and feasibility constraints. And we can also introduce uncertainty. Because this is a convex problem, a convex optimization problem, there are tools available for robust optimization that can handle uncertainty. For example, our uncertainty in the case of a, of a uh, legged robot 
would be, for example, the mass of the, of the human user. We don't really know how much each person weighs or if they're wearing a backpack, put a bunch of books in there to go to class or whatever, or iPads these days, right? Um, and uh, the position might be a little bit uncertain, right, because the environment might, might result in differences in kinematics and so forth. The efficiency of the actuator itself might be uncertain, and there could be all sorts of unmodeled dynamics as well. So now, uh, this, this allows us to, again, minimize energy consumption and also uh, guarantee that we still satisfy actuator constraints as the activity might change. But now, there's another approach that we've been investigating, which is uh, not using series elastic, elasticity, but instead using quasi-direct drive actuators. This is a different way of achieving compliance. It's just that it's not compliance through a spring. It's compliance through the lack of inertia in the actuator. So the, the actuator, um, the, 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 the actuator does not have significant dynamics of its own. So you can just f almost freely rotate the, the, uh, the, the motor from the load. It's called back driving. All right. So the way we do this is we have to have a, a very low gear ratio because the inertia reflected the, the inertia of the, of the rotor, of the motor, reflected through the transmission, scales with the square of the gear ratio. And so the, the, the whole game comes down to getting this gear ratio down as small as possible in order to reduce the inertia of the actuator. But then when you, when you reduce the gear ratio, then you have to deal with making sure you have sufficient torque coming out of the actuator as well. And so that's where the high torque motors come in. We have to use high torque uh, motors that typically are pancake motors because they have higher torque density. And, and these two things combined allow us to do some pretty nifty things with our Gen 2 leg. So you can see it's very back drivable. This is powered off. It requires one to three Newton meters of torque to back drive the knee or the ankle. So it's very back drivable. And the goal there is to allow more dynamic motion and also energy harvesting. Because when this leg is, is doing uh, negative work, when it's braking, the motor is doing that. And that results in a charge going to the battery to prolong battery life and so forth. Also, there's fewer moving meshing parts. And those parts are moving slower than a highly geared transmission, which results in less noise. So we can finally address that problem with the, the lawnmower sounds coming from the prosthetic leg. All right, so here's the video I promised you where the subject will walk without the handrails at some point. So here it has very compliant impacts with the ground because there's almost no inertia at the joint. Of course, the, the limb itself has inertia. And it's also able to have a, a very fast push off to swing transition because it has a very high bandwidth. It's one of the benefits of a quasi-direct drive actuator is very high bandwidth. So you can go from high force at push off to high velocity at early swing in almost no time. The battery is right here. Yeah. Yeah. And it's enough for about, uh, I believe, it depends on walking speed, but it's enough for f around 5,000 steps uh, or more. Yeah. Oh. Um, 50 decibels adjusted is about the noise level of a, a household refrigerator. So very quiet. That's something that at least we find acceptable at home, right? And again, we're not stuck to treadmill walking. <clears throat> And one of the other benefits of the uh, quasi-direct drive actuator is, is, again, I mentioned earlier, uh, energy regeneration and energy sharing between the joints. So when the knee's doing negative work and the ankle's doing positive work, they'll share that energy 
rather than the battery having to provide all of it. Um, and that resulted in a, uh, a specific power of about 50% 50 less specific power than the state-of-the-art uh, Vanderbilt prosthetic leg. Um, so we've cut, we've cut energy consumption in about in half. All right, so in the last part of this talk, I want to talk, I want to switch topics to exoskeletons. However, still very related to the, the latest leg I showed you in the sense of its actuation paradigm. And so, um, so the state of the art for exoskeletons um, is they're primarily des designed for spinal cord injury applications where the, the human can do very little to move their own limbs. And so the exoskeleton has to do everything. And so in this context, the, it makes sense to design very stiff actuators so that the weight of the human subject doesn't back drive the, the, the actuator, the joints, so they don't collapse, right? However, that stiffness means that these are not very useful for uh, working with stroke or anyone who has voluntary control of their, of their limbs. And so where my lab is going with this is going towards a more partial assistive paradigm where instead of having stiff actuators, rigid actuators, we have back drivable actuators. And we use quasi-direct drive designs to achieve that. And also, we don't want to use kinematic control in the context of partial assistance because, again, even with a back drivable actuator, you need the controller to not be creating forces that oppose the human's intention, right? So if you're, if you're controlling kinematics, then the human still must follow the, the kinematic trajectory that the, the, that the robot tells them to follow. And so that's where we're heading towards energetic control objectives. And so in our, our, our patient populations of interest are stroke, OA, uh, advanced age, and, and overuse injuries. So as I, as I hinted at, um, we, we have this quasi-direct drive paradigm where um, we have a 24 to 1 gear ratio in this particular exoskeleton, which has a powered knee and a powered ankle. Um, yet we're still able to produce large torques at each actuator, so about half of what they would need um, in everyday life. So this, can, this is actually still a quite powerful exoskeleton in terms of partial assistance, um, but only about one newton meter of back drive torque. And it appeared on the cover of IEEE Control Systems magazine a couple years ago. And so in terms of how we control it, we are using a method called energy shaping, otherwise known as Lagrangian or, or Hamiltonian shaping. And the idea here is that we model the human body as a Lagrangian. Okay? The Lagrangian is a, is a uh, scalar function that is kinetic energy minus potential energy. And the reason that matters is because if you put it into the Euler-Lagrange equations, it spits out the, the equations of motion, which we see here. So like M, for example, is the matrix of, of masses and inertias um, and how they depend on, on joint angles. C is the matrix of Coriolis centripetal terms, and G is the vector of gravitational terms. And we have orthosis torques, which, of course, influence the dynamics. And so in energy shaping, at least the way we're using it, we are designing the control input U such that when we close the control loop, the closed loop system dynamics behave like a different mechanical system. Okay? So now this mechanical system corresponds to a, a different Lagrangian where mass and inertia have been reduced. That's the idea. We use, we use the control torques at the, at, the, at, the, at the orthosis joints to reduce the perceived mass, gravity, uh, inertia of the human body so that they can use less uh, muscle effort to move their limbs and to fight gravity and so forth. So this is the idea. And, and in the case of underactuation, which we, we do deal with here, this is challenging. There's something called the matching, matching conditions that need to be satisfied to show that there exists a control law that, that gives you this closed loop system. And that's not trivial. It's a set of partial differential equations. But we have some uh, clever ways to deal with that. And Jinping is in the room somewhere uh, uh, and working on that hard. And so here's a, a, a demonstration of our uh, knee and ankle exoskeleton doing energy shaping on the human user. And you can see that he's able to sit, stand, walk, uh, 
freely. Now this is an able-bodied user, so he could do this normally. But the fact that the exoskeleton isn't stopping him says a lot. Okay, because it's very back drivable. He's able to continue to be in control of, of his movements while being supported by the exoskeleton. And so we've done some, uh, some analyses of this. Um, we look at EMG activation. Uh, VM means vastus medialis. And we were able to show that with the, the uh, assistance, the active mode, this is, so blue is the EMG activity when the exoskeleton is on and powered on. We see that it's lower than the case of bare without the exoskeleton, and passive is wearing the exoskeleton but without the motors on. So we actually see a pretty substantial drop in the EMG activity of this particular muscle. And red is the, is the torque showing that it's doing something to, to do that, right? So this is for sitting, sit to stand. And we see also promising results uh, for walking, where again we see in blue this is the EMG activity of the, of the, of the soleus muscle. Um, which is reduced during, especially during uh, uh, push-off uh, with the assistance. Okay, so this is my last uh, exoskeleton I want to talk about. And so this is a powered knee only, and it's a much smaller scale exoskeleton than the one I showed you earlier. And so this is meant to be a conservative treatment for OA, and also to prevent uh, lower back strains. So for example, when people have to, have to lift things repetitively um, in, in warehouses, in the military, uh, assembly lines, et cetera. Uh, we want an exoskeleton that can assist that so that they don't um, fatigue and then use their back in an un, unsafe manner. And so here, because we're primarily targeting individuals who are, who are more able-bodied, who have very minor impairments, if any at all, um, we took this to the next extreme where we have only a seven to one uh, gear ratio. And in order to um, reduce the gear ratio that much, we had to come up with a custom design for an electric motor that can produce higher torque for longer periods of time. And so in order to do that, we use encapsulated windings, which have a, a more efficient heat transmission uh, so that the heat around the windings of the motor get distributed to the environment in a more efficient manner. So that way we can have a higher continuous torque. So this is less than half a newton meter of back drive torque and up to 20. Uh, now I should update this. Now it's up to uh, 25, right, Chris? 25 newton meters because we improved the magnets. OK. So this just demonstrates it's very easy to, to move around with this thing. And one of the applications is assisting stair ascent because that's a potential home use application, especially for advanced age. And here's the uh, lifting and lowering experiment that Nikhil conducted, where um, we uh, have a, how, how, how heavy was this, like 20 pounds? Yes. 20 pounds, and um, we have a force plate to make sure that the subject isn't biasing one leg versus the other. And then we're recording EMG activity of mul multiple muscles, but we're only gonna show one of them. And so this is bare mode, just, just a baseline. This is passive mode, so the, wearing the device, but it's powered off. You see very minimal difference, which is actually kind of good in itself. It's very back drivable. And this is active mode. And blue is the EMG. Red is the torque coming from the exoskeleton. And so you see that the EMG has dropped. And this is the rectus femoris. Yes. So, right. so um, this is a clear picture of this plot. So you're able to see, again, a, a reduction in the uh, muscle activation. And the, the goal, again, is to, pre is to prevent fatigue so that proper lifting form is maintained for longer. So in closing, we have uh, several ongoing studies that are more towards clinical outcomes. So we're looking at functional outcomes for stroke subjects, assessing muscle tension and posture during lifting, lowering, and carrying, and assessing muscle tension and pain in, in knee OA subjects.
We, we have enrolled one OA subject, but the results, we're still, we're still looking at the data. We haven't really processed it, processed it yet. And then a very quick overview of some other projects. And I'm sorry that I'm missing some people um, uh, from this presentation, uh, but we have several other collaborative projects um, back at UT Dallas, as well as Virginia Tech and UT Arlington. So in closing, I just want to uh, recognize the contributions of my uh, lab members. And this is just a, 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 a subset of the lab. Uh, but this is the last photo we took in Dallas before the big move. Um, and then the funding agencies, NIH, NSF, and the Burroughs Welcome Fund. So happy to answer your questions.